I'm, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Georges Benjamin, the Executive Director of uh, the American Public Health Association. And I'm here with um, Dr. Skip Harris, who is a um, biographer of our, one of our founders, um, in fact, our main founder, um, um, Dr. Stephen Smith. And um, Skip, it's really great to, uh, to have this conversation with you. George, thank you very much. Yeah. So Skip, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, you know what was the, the world like many years ago and how did APHA kind of emerge from, uh, um, I think you told me that they kind of emerged out of the, the Civil War. I did. Um, there had been movements before the war to deal with issues around quarantine and urban sanitation, but they were basically scattered groups of doctors who would get together in meetings and say, we really ought to do something. Um, and then get together the year after that and say, yeah, you know, we really should do something. And then they had three meetings. And then in 1861, there's this minor issue in Fort Sumter that kind of derails everything. So the Civil War um, goes down the track and a lot of these people end up, you know, serving in it. Stephen Smith is in New York as a surgeon. Um, he's got a new medical school he's getting started. He's in his 39, 40s, born in 1823. So... 1863. He's 40 years old. He's a little young, a little old to be going to the fronts, although he does for a few weeks at a time. But he's got a career and he gets roped into serving Union Army hospitals, which he does. And he says, you know, he really could be a lot better. And he's speaking kind of as a surgeon with an interest in cleanliness and in good surgery without knowing anything about the germ theory. Um, but he writes a handbook for the Union Army about, which becomes literally the Union Army Surgical Field Manual. Um, and then as he inspects these hospitals, um, he you know, comes to see how the sanitation is not working very well. And then, of course, in the field, it's horrific. People are dying from typhoid far more than are dying from uh, Confederate or Union Army uh, rifle balls. Um, so as the war ends, and in 1866 in New York, cholera comes back. And um, Smith gets roped into just before that doing a survey of New York sanitation. And he brings all of his buddies, he's a civilian at that point, all of his buddies to bear to do this 17 volume survey of New York, which is a, a genuine public health landmark. Um, that's done. And then as the war concludes, uh, cholera comes and there's a big push to kind of clean up New York and, and get some laws passed. Well, this leads to passage in 1866 of the Metropolitan Health Act, which is the first law anywhere that gives police authorities to public health people. Until then, they'd been mainly uh, in quarantine. If a ship rolls into port with yellow fever, you can do something about it. But if the city streets are a mess and cholera is everywhere, you really can't. I mean, it, you know, it just wasn't working. And this, this law was written by a a lawyer modeled on English law, and it gave the basically a metropolitan, not New York City, body very strong health authorities based kind of on Smith's work. But he fades into the background after that and goes back to being a surgeon. Fast forward a couple of years, Tweed is beginning to kind of rise through the ranks in New York City. And New York City takes back its public health authority, and Smith gets roped into being on the board of the Department of Health of New York City. Um, a couple of years later, about 1870-ish, um, as things kind of roll forward, uh, the board is really pretty busy and Smith is overwhelmed. And it, it kind of dawns on him, and this is a very early part of the progressive era, that we should professionalize public health. At, interestingly, at the same time, a lady reformer comes to him and says, you know, we should professionalize nursing. And she comes to him to help start the first nursing college in the country at Bellevue Hospital. And he helps her get that done. Literally, simultaneously, he gets a group of his friends in his office in New York City, his public health office, and says, we really ought to form some sort of national organization so we can kind of cross pollinate and move this ball down the field. That gives rise to the American Public Health Association, which was sort of organized in 1872 and kind of held its first meeting the following year. Um, 
So that, that's kind of the genesis of the American Public Health Association. Wow, wow. One thing I would sort of add to that is Smith's vision, and he has two visions right at the start. The first is that improving human longevity is the government's business. Matter of fact, he make he says it's probably the only reason the government should exist in many ways is to give people longer and healthier lives. And then the second is that the mission of the APHA should be bringing about laws to create strong health boards. We can talk about how all of that played out in the next 150 years. Wow. So, you know, I, I'm an ER doc and I suddenly found myself being the health commissioner in Washington, DC. Um, you know, anything more about how Dr. Smith made that transition from being a surgeon um, to, to actually, you know, being a more of a public health guy? I hear, I hear the interest in population health that you just articulated. Well, that's, that's a very interesting question in many ways because he did not. Um, Smith was a surgeon and uh, antisepsis made surgery possible after 1846 and made surgery kind of the leading edge of medicine. Well, so surgeons were somewhat attuned to the idea that cleanliness was a good thing. Um, and because of an, uh, anesthesia, they were uh, in many ways sort of the leading edge of medical science because basically therapeutics had damn near nothing to offer. So it became kind of a mantra in medicine and on the leading edge of medicine that an ounce of prevention was worth a pound of cure, that you should prevent illness because you really weren't very good at treating it. And Smith, who was a real sort of uh, aggressive surgeon very early, became a conservative surgeon very quickly. In the Civil War, he counseled against amputations and he showed how to do it, how to treat a limb injury without amputating. So he is um, very much in step with the idea of kind of you know, not using heroic medicine and, and preventing disease rather than trying to cure it because you really, you really couldn't. But he wanted to remain a surgeon. That was where his money came from, quite frankly. He didn't make very much money in public health. And he had a family of six kids and a wife and two in-laws that he was kind of supporting. Um, so he was on the teaching faculty at uh, Bellevue Medical College um, and at Bellevue Hospital. And he's doing kind of part-time public health work. Well, as this plays forward over the next 10 years, a new generation comes on board. And um, John Shaw Billings, very well known to uh, anybody who's interested in medical history, uh, John Shaw Billings, a generation younger, uh, becomes president of the American Public Health Association 10 years after Smith and says, you know, this new generation of public health professionals really should have nothing to do with practicing medicine. There are a lot of conflicts that arise when you practice medicine with your wealthy patients uh, that conflict with the goals of public health and, and sap your time, and you shouldn't do it. Uh, on the other hand, old people like Stephen Smith, well, you know, they're the founders and, and they, can, they can make that happen. Smith at this point has like another 35 or 40 years of work ahead of him, um, but he's considered in 1880 kind of a grand old man of public health who is one of the founders, but kind of needs to step aside and let the young generation do their thing. Well, kind of fast forward through all of that, and that's exactly what happens. And you get generations of people who are public health professionals and try to make a living uh, doing it. Um, and they professionalize, you know, their work, which is, which is good, but they somewhat become captives of the system. Smith stays a surgeon. I mean, he, he makes his living as a surgeon. He goes back and forth from public health. And that's why he's got no statues to him because he starts things and then moves on. And then many years goes back to just becoming a surgeon. He wrote two, you know, two editions of a surgical textbook. Um, and, and, and yet it gives him credibility in uh, public circles that a lot of public health professionals uh, kind of did not have because he could present himself as a man of science outside the system. And when he said, you know, you really should do this, uh, people kind of took note because he did not have um, an agenda, uh, at least, you know, he, 
he was not perceived as having an agenda other than doing what was right for the public because he was not part of any institution. So Smith actually stayed a surgeon, moved into public health, moved out of public health, then moved into mental health, then moved out of mental health and moved into social welfare, which he did almost until the day he died. Wow. Tell us a little bit about his time in, in mental health. I, mean, I don't know that anyone knows that story. You know, it's, it's fascinating because there's a, uh, uh, one of the guys who helped me in this project, who just passed away last year, had a correspondence with one of his mentors, uh, a historian mentor, and said, you know, you really ought to write about Smith's mental health story because it's never been told. And this physician, this historian physician, Gerd Brick, said, you know, there's probably something in there, but I was more interested in surgery, so I didn't bother to do it. Well, nobody bothered to do it. It's never been done. But for six years, Smith was a one-man director of mental health for the state of New York. And the state of New York at that time had 10% of the country's population and 20% of an institutionalized mental health. And Smith visited every single patient. It was stunning. But the difference was, this was from like 1881 to 1887, he brought a public health perspective to the job that had never been done before and has not quite frankly been done very much since. So Smith didn't know much about mental health, but he kind of jumps in and says, we need to collect data, just like he and Elisha Harris and the other people had done in public health. And then he started saying, well, what's a quality indicator? He didn't use those words. He said, you know, if you're putting people in restraints, you're just not up to, you're not up to the times today. And, and that included, by the way, chloral hydrate, which was a drug that was in use then. So he collects data on who's putting people into restraints and he collects data and says, it's not just whether you're doing it, it's what are you preventing? And then he says, well, you, are you preventing assaults on other patients or assaults on attendants? And he starts correlating the data in a public health kind of way. He looks for evidence of sanitation as public health had done. He sends a report, he's been on the job six months, 1881, and he sends a 270 page report to the governor when he gets done. The next year, it's 400 pages. Nobody reads these things. <laughs> okay. Nellie Bly blows the system up in about 1884 when she gets herself admitted um, to Bellevue and writes this expose for the New York world. And, and basically, she says stuff Smith's been saying for the last three years. But because it makes the newspapers, something finally happens to it. So Smith's contribution to public health on one hand was bringing, I mean, on mental health, was bringing a public health perspective that kind of got sort of ignored, but he also brought his kind of legislative energy to it. So in 1889, he gets a law passed replacing him, a one person gang, with a three man commission for mental health. And in 1890, he gets a law passed having the state of New York take over basically the management of every insane person in the state of New York. Now, that's a huge advance because most of those people had been in poor houses or in really kind of very, very marginal conditions. There were some good state hospitals, but most of the mentally ill in New York were just pushed into a, a closet or, or you know a poor house. And the state takes it over in 1890 and they change the names of all of their buildings from insane asylums to state hospitals. So Smith really was the person who brought the state hospital system into being, which was an, a huge advance in 1890 because it forced the state to take ownership of the problem. In the next 50 years, it became a uh, almost a negative because state hospitals became big warehouses, uh, not Smith's vision at all. And he warned against all of that. So Smith had actually a tremendously uh, powerful role in mental health, part of which is still quite quite frankly, overlooked because the, met, the public health perspective is still, in my mind, is still lacking in mental health. Wow. Well, you know, um, I know there's a story about him being involved in the medical licensure, he and the American Public Health Association, you know. Uh, I love to hear that story because I know that the American Medical Association always gets credit for pushing medical licensure, but I don't think- they pushed it. They pushed it, but they did nothing. <laughs> God, God bless them. You know, now that, that's, that's not correct after the turn of the 20th century. Okay. Um, but before 
the turn of the 20th century. The AMA had been in business in, since 1847. Um, and it said, you know, we really need to chase the quacks out of our out of our ranks. And it doesn't take a, a, a sociological historian very long to say, you know, that kind of looks like a guild and it kind of looks like you're trying to sort of, you know, monopolize your profession. And yes, you know, uh, and, and, and there's a good and a bad to that. I mean, you, to this day, you can still argue whether medical licensure is a good thing. But I think most people tend to say, yeah, it does sort of allow one people to be doctors and not allow another people. And we want it that way. But that argument was wide open in the 1850s because they were competing medical sex and medical science didn't have much to offer. But Smith in 1874, at the meeting of the American Public Health Association, doctors have been kind of going around and around the axle saying, you know, we need to take, take ownership of our profession and chase out the bad guys, much like had already happened in England with Royal Society. And nobody wanted anything to do with this because they saw it as kind of a monopolization effort uh, by one group of doctors to chase out another. And they were competing homeopaths and eclectic competing medical sex that were in the public eye, kind of comparable. And quite frankly, since their therapies weren't very good, um, a lot of people would say even today, yeah, <laughs> what's the difference? I mean, if, 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 if this homeopath wants to give me nothing um, and this allopath wants to give me mercury, I'll go with nothing, you know? Um, so that's the environment and yet it's evolving. Surgery is clearly advancing. Uh, homeopaths are using larger doses. Allopaths are getting a little bit of science behind their therapeutics and they're kind of converging. Um, and he says, you know, this is in 1874, um, good medicine and good medical practice is a public health problem. And it's a public health mission. And he stands up and says, the medical profession cannot do this. Government has to do it. And that was somewhat of Smith's mantra. I mean, he was a progressive who thought government could do things to make people's lives better. And he says, government ought to own this. Well, I'm going to tell you, darn near no doctor was going to buy that premise. Let's let the camel's nose under the tent. Let's have the state tell us what to do. They wanted nothing to do with that. But Smith was the first person that I could find who sort of framed medical licensing as a public health issue. And two of the people who heard him give that talk go back to their states and do get laws passed that are public health laws that bring medical licensure into the states. And there had been some laws passed before then, but they weren't particularly effective. These laws had real teeth in them. One was in Illinois, John Rausch, who was a president of the American Public Health Association later. And he gets two laws passed, one for public health state State Board of Public Health and the other for State Board of Licensure. And then James Reeves, who was the 13th president of the APHA, gets a law passed in West Virginia, which is one law that says that this is public health and it includes taking care of sick cows, uh, typhoid, and medical licensure. And it's the first real law in the country that has that effect. And then that law gets challenged and becomes a Supreme Court precedent that is the precedent for medical licensure everywhere at least as best I could tell and trying to figure out where this idea came from, Smith was seemingly the first person who, who brought it up. And then it was a couple of people in his audience who kind of took it and ran with it. It may have been in the, in the atmosphere at, the same, at that time, but I, I couldn't find anybody else who really articulated it before Smith did. You know, we have that, that experience today. We, we pass policies and then our, our members go out and use them to, to, to change the world. So. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, today we're, we're dealing with COVID-19 and, um, you know, the whole issue of quarantining and masking and all of the, the non-pharmacological interventions that we're, we're doing today. Um, there are many people who think that's new. Um, I, I suspect Dr. Smith had to deal with that when he was a, a health official. Yeah. Well, the, the issue of quarantine in particular is one, because there was a su Supreme Court case, Gibbons versus Ogden, which I think it was around like 1829, which is, you know, the law of the land that says that um, interstate commerce is the province of the federal government. Quarantine is the business of the states. And, you, you know, that's, that's a little bit of a head scratcher, you might say. But the concept is that once some person arrives via interstate commerce in inside a state, what happens after that is the state's business. 
And that was kind of a, it was kind of a, it was a landmark Supreme Court case and it's still there. And it basically creates this kind of funny schism where there's a never, never land uh, between, you know, in, in these pandemics that we're dealing with today. And that, you know, the country had plenty of experience with in the 19th century of, uh, you know, if, if a disease arrives through a common carrier, who's in charge of trying to keep that darn disease from killing people? And the short answer is um, everybody and nobody. And the challenge then was, okay, um, clearly nobody is not gonna work very well, what do we do? And Smith saw the challenge. Um, I, I think other people did too, but he was at a pivotal point and he articulated it better than most and said, you know, uh, here's what we need to do. So Smith was the kind of guy who got into the nuts and bolts of things, said, okay, Gibbons versus Ogden is real. Um, we need to work with it. And what he wanted to do was say the federal government will control common carriers and uh, then the states will control what happens in the states, but they will work together. And the role of the federal government in that situation should be to synchronize the states and where the states uh, do not have the capability or are not acting to step in. And that's exactly what happened to us in 2020 as we ran kind of headlong in, into that sort of structural issue and we couldn't get through it. And Smith had to navigate that particular problem in the 1880s when smallpox arrived and he's on this National Board of Health. So he literally goes around the country. Um, here's a fun fact. Busiest port of immigration in the United States in 1882 is New York City. <clears throat> Would you care to guess what the second busiest port of immigration is in the United States in 1882? Oh, um, the New Orleans or Boston? Right, Port Huron, Michigan. Oh, <laughs> right. I've never gotten that. Okay. I did not see that. Did not see that coming. I had no idea. But the effect of that was that the Midwest was pretty attuned to this arriving smallpox coming from their immigrant population. All of these Northern Europeans are getting off the boat in Port Huron and going to Minnesota um, and parts there, there, there and two surrounding. So Smith goes to what was called the West, Illinois, and he gets a voluntary agreement that people getting off the boat will go nowhere until they've been vaccinated because the incubation period for smallpox um, was um, longer than it then took to get from Europe to the US. Previously, if a ship arrived and they had smallpox, you just put the ship in the harbor till smallpox cleared up. But now that travel is getting better, so you can get smallpox exposed in Liverpool and get off in Port Huron and be in Indiana before it shows up. So he gets them to voluntarily agree to either get vaccinated or to stay in quarantine, exactly the dilemma we faced in 2020. Um, and they were able to make it work because they'd seen it before and they had the cooperation between the states and the federal government. And I expect people were much more afraid of smallpox than we seem to be afraid of COVID. <laughs> you know, if you look at the numbers, you're gonna say, you know, it wasn't that big a smallpox epidemic, but yes, they were afraid because they had had experience with people dying in epidemics, cholera, yellow fever, and smallpox. The last time we had people dying with an epidemic was 1918. There's not many of us around who really have strong memories of that. Uh, everybody in 1881, uh, just about, you know, could recall an epidemic. So when you started uh, seeing that song, it, it kind of resonated with them and, and people were uh, more comfortable uh, sort of foregoing something. And quite frankly, this was, uh, this was done to the immigrant population. So the the local population didn't have, you know, wasn't affected nearly as much. I mean, it's like, okay, you want to make life tough for immigrants, go ahead. You know, uh, so there was a difference with that thing as well. Wow. So when one time of, of, of hit when he lived, um, one of the real stains on the, on the, on public health is kind of our support for eugenics as a field. There were people that were very much in support of eugenics. Um, um, I understand that uh, that wasn't something that uh, um, Dr. Smith was a supporter of. 
No, he wasn't. Um, they, they were, there was, eugenics is, is sort of a range of beliefs. And, and John Harvey Kellogg, the guy, cornflakes guy, who was sort of a eugenics booster, but he had another mantra called eusthenics, which is sort of a much more benign version of the same thing. But it came from the idea that prevention is good. Um, but people began to realize that uh, it was very hard to, to sort of prevent social problems. You know, you, you address poverty, you address education, and they still felt they weren't getting anywhere. And as Darwin's ideas moved through the pipeline, they say, you know, some of this is just genetic. I mean, there are people that are just seem to be in trouble from the get go. And this was not, you know, just criminal behavior. Uh, or even morality, it was mental illness as well. You know, there are the people who are born into families of people who are, uh, you know, have mental challenges and they have mentally challenged children. So they began to sort of appreciate that the best way to prevent that from going forward was to prevent the sort of birth of people with those characteristics. Now, you know, you can see some logic behind that and then you have to step back and ask yourself, well, okay, what does that really mean? And, and a lot of people did exactly that. They said, well, okay, I get that, but you know, we have moral codes too. A few other people, well, more than a few, some other people just said, you know, moral codes be damned, getting this thing under control and stopping poverty and immorality and insanity. Uh, these are our paramount goals and our best tool appears to be eugenics. Uh, so let's do it. Um, and so you, you get that group of people on the one hand, and, and in the book I talk about one of the most glaring examples was an Episcopalian minister. Um, and you get people on the other hand are saying, that's a terrible idea. You know, that, that is horrifically immoral. Um, and, and so I'm not sure I'd call it a blot on public health that you listen to or navigated issues around eugenics because it was... It was a scientific approach to prevention um, that was grounded in both uh, good impulses, prevention, and good science, genetics, um, that had the possibility of going off a moral cliff. And the extent to which, you know, people in our country or our organizations help push it off that cliff, you're going to say, okay, that's not good. Now, to be fair, by the 1920s, that eugenics enthusiasm in the United States had kind of really waned. I mean, they, they were castrating insane people and still doing those kind of things uh, into the 20s. But the general sort of public thinking about it was, you know, this is not the cure-all that it was presented to us. Germany kind of took a slightly different approach to it, you know, more than slightly. Um, and, and at least as I understand it, uh, our country had, had sort of backed down, and most countries, except for a few, had, had kind of backed down from that, although we're still enthusiasts. Smith, every step of the way, said, you know, I see insane people all the time. They're immigrants, and people were saying, well, immigrants are genetically inferior. And he was saying, no, they're not. You know, immigration is very difficult. And there are some people who kind of get pushed over the edge by it. So yes, yeah, Smith was, I mean, he, his morality was very much opposed to uh, the, the kind of uh, sort of idea that your genetic stock is inferior or that any human being is inferior to another. And he pushed back against that kind of, you know, whenever he got the chance. Well, that, that's good to hear, you know, because I guess one of the other questions is his views on slavery. Obviously he served in the Union Army, so he, was, he, he worked for the North. Um, yeah, Smith came from, he grew up in the Finger Lakes area of New York State. And I don't think, you know, I, I didn't appreciate, that was a cauldron of social reform. If you think about the revolutions of 1848 in Europe, there were counterparts of those in the U.S. There were women's rights movement. There were very strong abolitionist movements um, in, in New York State. I mean, Frederick Douglass is in, upper, is, is in the Finger Lakes area of New York in later years with his newspaper, Polestar. Um, and, and so the, the, his, Smith becomes, as a teenager, he joins an abolitionist party uh, in his hometown of Spafford, New York. 
Um, and, you know, he's not a fiery abbot. He's not a fiery anything. One of the characteristics of Stephen Smith was that he was genuinely shy. Um, he was a good writer, um, but he was shy. And I, I have letters that he wrote to his fiance that are very romantic. And she would write back and say, you know, you're the coldest person on the planet when it comes to being in real life. Could you show a little warmth, please? You know, I mean, <laughs> she, this, this girl is like, you know, 13 or 14 years younger and very romantic. And he's just this kind of stern, not stern, but just quiet surgeon. So he's a quiet abolitionist. He just thinks it's morally not the, the right thing to do. And so uh, as the Civil War winds down, he goes to Richmond and he gets in, you know, some of these prisons where the, the, the Confederate Army kept the Union Army. And he's horrified. And there's one, ep he writes back to his wife and says, I go, I went to this church service of, of you know, colored people. And he says, it was wonderful. They all knew the gospel. They really kind of enjoyed being there. These are really decent people. And I would much rather spend time with them than any Confederate. You know, uh, he, again, I, he wasn't so much an abolitionist as, you know, uh, publicly, um, as, as somebody just said, slavery is the wrong thing to do. And again, like he did with eugenics, he just sort of had a moral code that says, you know, kind of people are people, you know, let's, let's not take it any further than that and make it any, make life any tougher than it already is. Wow. Well, you know, in 2022 this year, we are um, big national celebration that our nation is having around um, the legacy of um, Frederick Long uh, Law Olmsted. Yes. And I, I understand they knew each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Quite a bit. And actually, that, that's another fun story in many ways. Frederick Law Olmsted, of course, is best known for Central Park and landscape architecture. But he was really the guiding force behind the United States Sanitary Commission for a few years during the Civil War, which was kind of America's first industrial strength public charity. Um, and, and then he left and went to California and he comes back to New York and does more Central Park stuff. In 1872, Smith, who has met him through the Sanitary Commission, and there's cross, cross paths in New York City, says, you know, we need you in public health. And Olmsted is very much into the idea that, you know, and this is very much part of his legacy, that the, the natural environment is good for people's welfare. And he had kind of an idea that it was their moral welfare as well as their physical welfare. So that was his guiding from it, he designs mental health hospitals, he designs parks and loads of things. And he's a big fan of trees. Well, Smith becomes a big fan of trees too. And it, it's kind of another interesting little story is that starting in the 1870s, he brings Olmsted into the American Public Health Association and gets him to write papers on the value of greenery in public health. Fast forward, 30 or 40 years, Smith is still an advocate of trees and he's in New York City, which is busy cutting down every tree they can find so they can build subways and, and skyscrapers. And, he's, and he writes a paper saying, you know, trees are good for the urban environment, very much in the spirit of Frederick Law Olmsted, except he goes straight to the public health side of it. He says they lower temperatures in the summer, which prevents heat stroke. They bring moisture into the air. They prevent cooling shade. It's a health issue. Smith, to cut to the chase on this one, begins to argue for putting trees in New York City streets, eventually becomes head of the Tree Planting Association and writes the law that now has trees in New York City's public streets. Yeah, you, you know, as we close this out, you're really just describing a, a real Renaissance man. Um, what, 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 what do we not, what do we need to know about Dr. Smith that you haven't told us? And I'm sure there's much, much. <laughs> well, the, the thing that fascinated me, really, George, was how did he get it done? You know, I've tried to do a few difficult things in my life and, and nothing of the magnitude that he did. I expect most of us have and just sort of run into, you know, people who don't see it our way and circumstances. And yet he's, he's changing public health, mental health urban trees. Um, he's even part of the reason there's a coroner's law in New York City. And how does he get all this thing done, particularly in cases of some of the public health law where eight times in a row it had failed and then he steps in and gets on New York State Board of Health on the ninth try. 
Um, and there's two kind of interesting answers to that question. Um, one is he was just really persistent, um, but quietly and apolitically so. And so he would come at you with data and he would come back at you with data. Um, and he would try to really avoid, you know, getting on somebody's political bandwagon. He was really trying to be the honest broker and because he kept his career in, as a surgeon that helped, helped him do it. But the other that sort of uh, kind of popped up in this biography saying, he's really into multimedia social marketing, isn't he? Yes, the 1870s. He's getting the newspapers on his side. He's writing letters to politicians. He's writing articles in the uh, medical journals. He is, you know, coming at a problem like getting a law passed in mental health, getting a law passed in public health, getting trees in the streets from about five different directions at once. And, you know, most of us probably don't do that. We work in our silos. And probably his, his biggest strength to me was his ability to kind of step outside of the silo and say, people live in different worlds and I need to reach them in the worlds in which they live. And if that means writing a, you know, an article for the Sunday section of the, of the newspaper, I'll do that. If it means writing a scientific journal article, I'll do that. If it means kind of twisting arms behind the scenes with legislators, um, let's do it. And he would, you know, get wealthy people to help him and then he'd go do it. So a lot of his stuff was done through what we would call multimedia social marketing and then his own personal qualities of uh, being kind of a non-inflammatory, quietly persistent human being. Wow. Well, Skip, I really appreciated having a conversation with you. I could talk with you about this all day. I, I love history and I've learned so much about uh, um, Dr. Smith today. Um, and I, I really appreciate you spending time with us. Um, and when your book is published, I need to get my autographed copy because I want to read it cover to cover. As, as you shall. It will be my pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolutely.